doubt, and a nine-month time of forced silence for Zachariah. Now, some of you men quit hoping because your wives will not give you a nine-month silent time. So just don't even go there this morning. But because of Zachariah's doubt, not his question, but his doubt, God let him think about it for a little while. In today's reading, God sends a bulletin by this same messenger, the angel Gabriel. With Zechariah the priest, the declaration came to an old man set in his ways who had very rigid ideas of what and who Messiah would be. We find that that message to Zechariah came in the capital city, Jerusalem, at the greatest place of worship of their time, the temple. And Zechariah was in the middle of performing a task of great importance and honor, surrounded by people worshiping. It was right in the middle of a prayer service. Now, here in this text, the message comes to a young girl who lives in a place that reeks of hayseeds. A young lady that would have been doing whatever young ladies in the country would be doing. Dishes, sewing, cleaning, feeding the goats, chores. I don't know what a farm girl would be doing. And yet the same angel comes to her with this announcement. And I believe this contrast shows us something really joyful about God. You see, God makes himself known to young and old. And God makes himself available to people who are clergy and lay people. And God reveals his good news to rural and city folk. God speaks to people, to everyone no matter who they are, where they live, what they do, God treats all people and loves all people the same. There's no hierarchy. And brothers and sisters, that brings me a whole lot of joy. Betrothed. Some of, your, some of your versions used that word. Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Betrothed, betrothal, not words we use all the time, are they? How, when's the last time you used that in everyday conversation? If you did, I'd like to talk to you. The reason it's not a common word for us is because it's not a part of our culture. This was something unique to the ancient world or to a world different at least from the Western world today. And for Mary's world, it was the normal practice of the Jewish people. Betrothal was the two-stage marriage process. The initial phase, called betrothal, involved a formal witnessed agreement to marry a bride, and her dowry would be paid by the family. And this was usually a match decided by the bride's father and family and the groom and his father and family. After this first stage was completed, the woman legally belonged to the groom and was known as his wife. In the first century, betrothal could take place starting at the age of 12. We don't know Mary's age, but it's pretty safe to assume she was a young teenager. The second stage of the betrothal happened a year, a full year later, when the bride moved into the groom's home, and then they were considered fully married. For many of us, the thought of a young teenager being married off is repulsive. As a matter of fact, for us, 
us in the Western world in 2021, it's pretty repulsive to us to think of anybody making the decision for a woman to marry except the woman and the man. And here is one of those places because our culture is different and our understanding of love, marriage, and even women is different. We understand why betrothal no longer applies. And that makes me pretty joyful. First time I took Jay to meet my mom and dad, I heard them. We were, they were out on the patio and we walked around the patio and when we left and headed down the driveway, I heard my mother say to my father, Oh Lord, R.B., what she brought home now? <laughs> now they would trade me in for Jay. <laughs> So I'm so glad that this doesn't apply to us anymore. And the whole reason I'm bringing this up is because, brothers and sisters, it is incredibly important when we are studying the Bible or talking about the Bible or reading the Bible that we understand because cultures are very different, things may not literally apply. Now, I know that makes some people squirm, but the truth is, it's just the way it is. We live in a different culture, therefore this particular, that, that doesn't mean that every Christian out there should follow the guidelines of betrothal. You see what I'm saying? And I want to keep bringing that up. I bring it up a lot. And I want to keep doing that because when we read the Word of God, we are looking for the revealed truth of God. What does the principle here say? So that's what we're looking for today. It doesn't say that Emma's about to get engaged and in a year have to move out of her parents' home and go live with some old man, or excuse me, some man. <laughs> you, you see how crazy that is? So when you're reading the Bible, look for the principle. What's God revealing here? What's God saying? What's the point? And I want to encourage you to read from big to little. What does the book of Luke say? What's it about? Why did God have that put in our canon? And then, what does chapter 1 of the book of Luke, what's it conveying to us? And then, what does that verse say? And then, what does that word say? Don't go the other way, or it could get you into hot water in a hurry. Let's see if we can find the principles, or at least one of the principles God is giving us, because in chapter 1 of Luke, there's lots. As a matter of fact, the hardest part for a preacher when you're preaching out of Luke is knowing what not to say. Most of the time, when an announcement is sent or made, the recipients are not the subject. But Luke is very careful to describe who this particular announcement is going to. So let's look at what this short scripture tells us about Mary. In verse 30, she is said to be favored or loved by God. And the word favored is a Greek word that means God is acting on her behalf. And reading the passage using that definition tells us God is the one extending grace because of who He is, because of His plan, because of His love, because of His purposes. What a joyful thought on the Sunday of joy. God is always acting on the behalf of His children. Today, as you said in this service, as you go out into the world, as you go back to your life, know that God Almighty, Creator of the universe, lover of all mankind, is acting on your behalf. That's the principle. God is acting. He was acting on Mary's behalf when he said, God has found favor with you. God is acting on your behalf. Brothers and sisters, take that with you on this Sunday of joy. May it bubble inside of you. 
Because you know what? The world's going to say to you, you're not good enough. You don't work hard enough. You don't do enough. You need to change the way you are. You need to change the way you look. Yeah, 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 da, la, la, wah, wah, wah. It will. That's what your friends will say sometimes. Unfortunately, that's what your family will say sometimes. But God says, I care about you and I'm acting on behalf of you. That's joyful stuff. Even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. He never stops. Never stops working. Even though it's God who is bestowing grace to Mary, the scripture here tells us some other things about her. She truly is a model for all believers. This passage shows us that she takes God at His word. Remember, in contrast to Zechariah, who knew the first five books of the Bible by heart, and maybe more than that, Zechariah, who had been a priest his whole life, Zechariah, who never th knew everything in his head there was to know about God, Zechariah, who was in the temple, in the holy place, lighting the incense. And yet, this young girl, farm girl, takes the angel at his word. She questions, but it's not because of the Greek. We know it's not, she's not questioning because she doubts, unlike Zechariah. She is thoughtful. She asks questions of the angel to clarify what the angel is saying. Brothers and sisters, that's joyful stuff. Do you know that when you're reading the scripture, do you know when you're talking about God, do you know when you go to Sunday school, we honored those people or a Bible study and you're talking about it, it's okay to ask questions of God? He loves your questions. Because there's a big difference in asking questions and doubting. Mary asked questions. And that shows us that she was true to God even as a young person. Young people today. God chose a young girl to carry the Savior of all mankind in the world. Wow! Have confidence. Have confidence in your belief in God. Have confidence in your belief in Jesus Christ. Remember that finding favor thing? God loves you. And God is acting on your behalf. And God wants to be close to you. And here's the reality. The world will tell you, oh, no, you're going to have, you're, you got it, you got to experience all this stuff before you can get to the place where you can believe in the Lord. And you got to go to the bottom of the barrel before you can come to the top. Hogwash. Let me tell you, you can come to Jesus Christ as a young person and you don't have to live in darkness. And you can walk in the way your whole life. Does it mean you won't have stuff? Sure, you're going to have stuff. But God will deal with that. I love stories of transformations of people who went into dark sin and God brought them out. Praise the Lord. I'm happy about that. I, I are one. But... It doesn't have to be that way. And the story of Mary shows us that. Mary believed at a very young age. The tone of the language here when Mary starts asking her questions is that she's just confused. And it's because she's not a dummy. She understands that she's a virgin, and if there's no husband, there can't be a baby. So Mary realizes the impossibility of what the angel is saying. 
It's a joyful thought that God communicates with those who are true to Him and are seeking Him. Now that's a joyful thought for Joy Sunday. People who are true to Him, people who are seeking Him, God will talk to you. And He'll do it in a lot of different ways. Here in Mary's story, He sent an angel. And I have heard people say, well, if God sent an angel to me, I might believe. Really? God has given us the written Word of God that these people did not have. We've got the, the end of the story. Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. We've got it. The, the, Mary didn't have this. Mary didn't have this. Paul didn't have this. God has incredibly blessed us. What a joyful thought on Joyful Sunday. God still sends messages. God still calls people. Now let's consider what the announcement actually said to Mary and what it says to us. The angel's words unveil some things about Jesus. It tells us of his position and divinity. Think of all the words that are used there in that little bitty passage. Son of God, Son of the Most High, Great, Holy, Ruler. It stresses his authority, seated on Israel's throne and reigning over a kingdom that will never end. That's some pretty big stuff. Jesus is the physical realization of Messiah or King of all the Old Testament promises. He's God in the flesh. That's some pretty big stuff. And Jesus is the reconciling hope for all creation and humankind that is broken by sin. That's a joy-filled announcement. Let me say that again just in case you didn't catch it. Jesus is the reconciling hope for all creation and all humankind that was broken by sin. You, me, the trees, the grass, whatever. Jesus is the hope. So, after Mary received this announcement from the angel Gabriel, we don't know if she sat there a while and thought about it, or maybe she made up her mind quickly. Chances are, she didn't really understand all the implications she would have to face ahead. Because there would be some challenges to saying yes here. Because if what the angel says really happens, if God really overshadows her, think about, think about the 14, 15-year-old brain here. If this really happens to me, or maybe we could say anybody's brain, if this really happens to me, and I become pregnant, what will I tell the honorable man that I'm engaged to? Because he's going to know. <laughs> it's just the reality here. He's going to know. I wonder if the thought crossed her mind that if Joseph tells people it's not his baby, in their culture, guess what would happen? Thump, thump, thump. It was perfectly legal to stone the woman and her die. Throw rocks at her until she dies. The normal reaction would seem to be almost to say, God, could you pick somebody else? I'm too young. I don't, I'm not strong enough. I'm not, I don't think I can do that. I don't want to do that. Let's just get honest. So 
So this joy-filled message sure had some difficulties involved, and Mary would have known that. Regardless of how long she thought about the angel's words, what we see is that she says yes. And when she does, that means she accepts God's plan for her life, not her plan. She accepts God's plan for her life. And believe you me, because we have the rest of the story, we know it wasn't rosy. It gets even more hard. She accepts all the joy and all the honor of heaven, but she also accepts the responsibility and the difficulty. When she says, here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. So this godly young lady says yes to God, no matter what will happen. She had a choice, you know. She could have said no and been among the oblivious millions who live out their lives being safe, comfortable, and snug. She could have just married and said no to the angel. Would God's plans, he, he, sure, his plans would have gone on, but it would have gone on with somebody else. If she had thought, oh, I just want to stay here in Nazareth and I just want my own little house and I just want my own little life and I just want me and Joseph to have just a wonderful time. That, there's nothing wrong with that. Except that God's plan asked her to do something else. Mary said yes, and God entered our world. God with us. Jesus grew up and he taught us what humanity was supposed to look like. And then he died as the sacrifice so we could be reconciled to God. Jesus was resurrected so that all creation will one day be made holy and live forever. A young girl's yes to God and the universe was changed. How about that? How about that yes? All of us, you, me, and the guy behind the door, we've all been given an announcement. Jesus is calling us to follow him. And it's not just to say yes at some point. Or Jesus is calling us to follow him. Follow him. Follow what he teaches. Follow who he is. Jesus is calling us to be like him. He's announcing that we be part of his kingdom so that the world can be changed. You see, I'm convinced that when we say yes to God, something eternal is going to be affected and change because we said yes. You know what? It's possible I may not even know what that is till I get to the other side. It's possible I may know what it is. But everyone has been given an announcement. Come to me, all ye. Remember that verse? Remember that call? Will we like Mary? Will our answer be, Here am I, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father,